What the fuck is up, world? Fiali, Plantic Fuck. We are back in this bitch. Another podcast for that ass. Otro grito. Estamos listo para continuar. To continue along this philosophical, ethical, comical, perhaps, hopefully, occasionally, definitely conspiratorial, and if I may be so inclined, perhaps a little bit spiritual journey that we've been going on together. For those of you who've been riding with me since the beginning of this podcast, for those of you who are just joining along, welcome. Make yourself at home. I'm glad that you are here, and I truly do hope that you will stay. And if not, I hope you find happiness on whatever other podcast it is that you feel will fill the void in your hole as this in your life, I should say, not your hole. It's a little bit of, let's say risque. Yeah. But let's say the the void in your life that we're all looking to satisfy. I don't know me personally, this podcast definitely does satisfy a hole in my life and also other podcasts that I listen to. Shout out to the motherfucking tinfoil hat podcast. Um, anyways, with that in mind, let's get the, the semantics, if you will, out of the way. Follow your boy on the gram, OG underscore ice nice 13, where you can get all the business El Grito podcast and hood philosophy related. If you haven't already, if you're finding this on the podcast app, I also use the Facebook and Twitter, though not as common as I do Instagram. But somewhere along those lines of that name is where you'll find me on those as well. And occasionally I'll upload there as well. For those of you who fucking rock with me from the gram. What's up, dog? It's good to see you. You know who you are. And I'm still glad that you're still here with me. It's been about two weeks since my last podcast. And um, in that time, I would dare say some more interesting stuff has occurred. So rather than beat around the bush, let's just get right into it. Since the last podcast, I, I I went back and listened to my last podcast and I was trying to make sense of it a little bit because I kind of felt as though I didn't want to give the impression that I was complaining because that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't the intention of the podcast itself. Right. I'm not trying to come across as a complaining person at all, period. I'm actually a very blessed individual. And um, I felt as though perhaps there was some parts in the last podcast that I felt could have been better clarified because of that. And the part that I felt that could have been clarified was the part about talking about normalcy, right? Seeking normalcy, namely in terms of modern society, settling back in as it were. Okay. Given all the shit that I talked about, about like the move and all that kind of stuff that I had engaged in. And, um, I think part of the idea that I was really trying to get towards is the realization that I'm, if you look over here, it's cause I have all my notes on my computer screen. So please pardon for those of you who are watching, if I keep turning around this way to look, right? Is um, the realization that I didn't really know what it was that I was working for. Okay. Kind of this understanding that I was just adrift, if you will, simply going through the emotions and the motions of life that I've imagined not only for myself, but of all reality. Okay. But not really acting upon them and any of the aims, right? Never acting upon any of the shit that I have in mind for what I want to do in my life in any in any way that is realistically authentic, okay? Following up uh, our, our podcast from Heidegger, we never get away from Heidegger, okay? Heidegger, I'm deeply invested in the Heideggerian philosophy. I don't even want to say Heideggerian philosophy. Obviously, it's not Watts philosophy, right? So um, I never really get away from it, okay? But that's one common co- concept that comes up in this Heideggerian, specifically philosophy, is the realization that we don't ever really touch down onto the ground and engage with the goals that we have in mind for what it is that we hope to do with our lives. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, we never touch down upon it like in a very meaningful way. So what I mean by that is to say that like, yeah, I'll fucking say that I'm going to do shit. You know what I mean? And I know it's not just me. I know it's plenty of us. We'll say that we're going to do shit, but we never really, you know, commit to it in such a way that's going to, you know, bring about the desired outcome that we hope for. You know what I'm saying? So when I say that I was kind of just acting upon any of the, I wasn't really acting upon any of the aims that I had set out for myself. I was just touching upon them in a surface level. So what I mean by that is like, oh, I'm going to be a podcaster. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. You know what I mean? Like it's just this grand totality of things that I had in mind of what I wanted to do with myself, but never really committing myself fully in a way, in a meaningful way. Okay. And uh, the little progress that I did have, it's, if anything, I feel more the appearance of progress when in reality, I kind of felt as though I was just spinning my wheels in place. You know what I'm saying? 
And again, I know I might I, I might be talking about myself specifically here, but I hope it's understood by this point that this is like something that we all experience. You know what I'm saying? And um, I know in this particular sense, when I was spilling, spinning the wheels, uh, what happened is I just found myself with entirely too many coals in the fire. Okay. And again, I just wasn't realistically committed to any of them in a meaningful way. The podcast goal, the coal, the book writing coal, the making videos coal. Like there's all different, you know, all different uh, irons in the fire is what I'm trying to say here. And, you know, when I first started, I had this roaring fucking flame and to desire to, you know, try to be as creative and artistically outputting as possible. But honestly, uh, since, you know, coinciding with the move, but dog, honestly, I'm just going to go on a limb and say fucking this whole year, man, this whole year has been fucked up, obviously, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not trying to state the obvious here. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that I feel this shit like on a personal level, bro. And I know I'm not the only one where, like, you know, the, the intuitive types, the emphatic types, you're, you know what I'm saying? We're feeling this shit hard as fuck. Everyone's feeling it hard as fuck, but it's bringing down just the the vibe, simply put, you know, just to keep it simple. And um, trying to fight through that, simply the realization that my spark had started to flicker a little bit, you know what I'm saying? In terms of wanting to be creative and, you know, having a creative output, okay? And um, I guess in a way, I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to recapture the initial spark and, you know, turn it back into that roaring flame. Despite the fact that one of my biggest fears in life is that flame itself flickering out, not because I'm dead, but because I've simply given up hope, because I've simply given up the desire to continue trying to, you know, kindle, if you will, that little spark into a roaring fire. But the realization that I just couldn't seem to get out of my way to make it happen was really starting to get me down, man. And, you know, my biggest fear, again, is that this cycle and this pattern of my life. I know I talk about, I know on the gram, I haven't really talked about it too much on the podcast, but one of my biggest fucking, one of the things that I'm most keen to are the patterns in life that I personally engage in. I'm sure the patterns in life that you personally engage in as well and their detrimental effect on the overall quality of our lives. You know what I'm saying? And me personally, one of the patterns that I discovered was this very fucking pattern where I engage in a new action and a new behavior and I'm fucking all in dog. I'm all in balls to the wall. You know what I'm saying? Initially. But then the fucking flame starts to flicker and I kind of start to lose focus and direction and I start to meander. The next thing I know, that passion, I've let it dwindle to a point where it's basically on the cusp of fading away. You know what I'm saying? And I realized that this is a pattern that I've continued for many things in my life. And that, you know, the fear associated with realizing that it, I, I may very well be doing the same, not just with this podcast, but with all the other things that I had in mind as well. You know what I'm saying? Um, this shit gets down. It gets me down, man. It really does. It gets me down. Fuck, it gets me down so hard to the point where giving up, honestly, appears to be the only reprieve from those negative emotions associated with the realization that you're kind of I want to use the word failing very loosely here. And by the time we get to the end of the podcast, I hope I'll be able to fully articulate why I use it in a very loose term. You know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, this fucking, you know, the idea of giving up, it's very comforting. And I'm not just talking about now on the goals even, but I'm talking about just in life in general and perhaps even, you know, on life. You know what I mean? What I mean by that is giving up with life. Like, ah, there's nothing to it. Just going to embrace this inauthentic mode of existence. And I'm just going to settle for the fucking bare minimum, the status quo that's, you know, pretty common. Uh, in this standard American mode of living. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but then there's also the way of giving up on life in terms of just outright ceasing to exist anymore. Suicide, dog, if we're going to be completely honest with one another. You know what I'm saying? Um, and in so doing, these thoughts, honestly, they bring me momentary feelings of peace. Okay? Um, the feelings of peace come when I no longer feel compelled to demonstrate, if you will, my worth and measure my worth in terms of success that is defined by the culture that we're living in. When it comes in terms of measuring my output on, in a scale of what is should be or what I believe should be, what I falsely believe, more importantly, should I, I have already accomplished because, again, that's predicated on our societal standards. And we're going to get into that here as this lecture, this podcast continues. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, despite the fact that it brings me this, you know, extended periods of peace and solace, like just fuck it, dog, just give up on everything. 
inevitably those feelings go away and I'm fucking revisited by the feelings of the desire to make shit happen and further feelings of utter frustration for allowing so much time to go by in which I did nothing to do it. When I essentially allowed myself to be falsely lulled, if you will, into a state of comfort, thinking that the real problem in my life was my inability to enjoy it for what it was. You know what I mean? Again, this goes back to the very beginning of the podcast when I said I didn't want to give the impression that I was complaining in my previous podcast because that wasn't the point. The point was just trying to articulate the situation where I'm currently finding myself in where I just don't feel I don't feel motivated. I don't feel compelled. I just don't feel the artistic spark and the struggle inherent with trying to fight through that. You know what I'm saying? Um Obviously, part of that is because my energy has undoubtedly been hampered. All of our energy is being hampered right now. There's a meme that I posted. It said, why does it feel like Mercury is always in retrograde? The times we're living in, dog, they're just fucked up. I know I'm not the only one. You know what I'm saying? Um, And the realization that I know that despite the fact that my energy might be hampered, I know full well what it is that I got to do to, you know, try to break out of that cycle. And in many ways, I'm kind of just a, too afraid to admit it, and B, more importantly, too weak occasionally, mostly, to fucking follow through with it. And that's pretty fucking devastating, man. And despite that devastation, though, I've, uh, for better or for worse, at least thankfully now, been able to fight through most of those feelings. And it's most of those feelings that are going to, that lead us, I should say, to the podcast for today. And the podcast for today is going to be briefly, it's just a quick summary, not even a full summary, just, you know, a nitpicking of certain parts of philosophy from that of Herbert Marcuse, as I discussed in my previous podcast. Herbert Marcuse is a critical theoretical philosopher, and his most uh, prominent ideas that he introduced to us is that of a one dimensional man. Now, I should mean, I should, uh, you know, um, emphasize here that I'm not trying to be gender exclusive. This is the language that he chose. And it's the language that I'm going to go with for the sake of, you know, authenticity to the philosophy. But it should also be included. It should under, be understood completely that it implies all people, irrespective of how you define your, your sexual orientation, your central, uh, your gender identification. It doesn't fucking, it, it, it's not trying to be, I'm not trying to be exclusive here. You know what I mean? Exclusionary. But I will be using the language one dimensional man. And essentially then what this philosophy is, is what he's going to refer to as an epistemological concept that distinguishes between one-dimensional and dialectical thought. So there's two forms of thought here. On the front, on the one hand, we have what they refer to as one-dimensional thought. And on the other hand, you have dialectical thought. Now, um, for introductory sake, if you just give me another quick second, you see I'm so fucking off at the moment that I'm even forgetting to fucking put my power on, bro. That's how fucking off this shit has been. But it's all good. Again, not trying to give the... I'm not trying to be complaining about it, dog. Very thankful for everything that I have in my life and everything that we're going to continue to keep going forward with. You know what I'm saying? The power for those of you who are watching strictly through or listening strictly through audio is my necklace, dog. The fucking Santa Muerte. La, la mi te casi tual. Mi madre Santa Muerte. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, going back to this podcast. Um, again, uh, for introductory sake, this one dimensional thought is one that should be understood as a mode of thinking that is strictly in line with the dominant and predetermined thought pattern cultivated in our Western capitalist society. So that's just a very fancy way of saying this very unreflective thought, right? Like we're, we've been brainwashed, we've been indoctrinated with this one way of viewing the world, and we do not question it in any way, shape, or form at all whatsoever, okay? Very one-dimensional in that respect, right? It's a predetermined pattern that's been cultivated for thousands of years. It's a, again, this reflexive form of thinking, if you will, that doesn't really consider outside potentialities other than those that have already been legitimized by the epistemic authority of whatever generation we're living in. So, you know, this epistemic authority that we're currently living in is the same one that's basically been in place since the foundation of this country. And since then, you know, there's not really been much thought to alternatives outside of it. And when you start to delve deeper into the foundation of this fucking society, we realize that it's really just an extension, a continuation of old European fucking ways of living. So the reality is that much of our, you know, understanding of reality is thousands and thousands of years old. And it's not really been fucking questioned or updated since then. Now, many people will point to the idea that we have, in fact, 
made progress, but you know, because now you have people who aren't enslaved, you have women with equal rights and all that kind of stuff, to which this one dimensional philosophy is going to argue, bro, that's prima facie. That's appearance only. That just at first glance, that's what prima facie means, right? At first glance, it would appear as though we've made all sorts of progress. But in reality, once you start to delve deeper, you realize we've not really made much reality or uh, rather much progress in terms of this society that we're living in from, you know, the Game of Thrones times. I'm rewatching Game of Thrones from the from the beginning to the very end right now. And it just blows my mind, realistically, how much progress we have not made from that form of society. You know what I'm saying? And it's not by accident because again, this one that's the one dimensional aspect of it. The one dimensional aspect is we're not encouraged to think critically about other dialectic. We're not encouraged to think more importantly dialectically about other potentialities. And thus, this is where we get the whole idea of a one dimensional man. Okay. This uh, one dimensional thought conforms, if you will, to existing thought and behavior that lacks both a critical component as well as one capable of envisioning potentialities that transcend our current society. So what I mean by that essentially is, yo, better, newer worlds are possible. The way that we're living in right now is just, it's it's a matter of arbitrary contingency, bro. We accidentally zigged, if you will, when we could have zagged or we could have accidentally zagged when we should have zigged. You know what I'm saying? And to assume that just because we arrived at this point that it's for any other reason, other than, you know, the collective push of human history, arbitrarily so, is kind of unfounded. You know what I'm saying? And that because of that, just because we're living in this kind of world doesn't mean that a different world is not possible. Like, that's nonsense. Of course, a different world is possible. It's just a matter of, you know, doing the work, if you will, necessary to manifest this different world. This is something that we're kind of seeing right now unfolding with the whole fallout again from the George Floyd tragedy, where people are trying to institute policies that will be different, radically so, from the world that we've already you know, been living in. And you're seeing it in full effect, the pushback, the one-dimensional pushback from people who refuse to just live, even try to live in such a world, right? Um... One of the things that they're arguing because of this is that they're citing the increase in crime, for instance, that's emerged since the initial defund the police movement, specifically I'm talking about in New York City. But, you know, the argument here is simple. We can't just quell progress because we got off to a rocky start. We can't completely put the kibosh on a new and different world, namely one where the police have been defunded because the initial outset was a little bit rocky. And yet the one dimensional thought was going to dictate that. No, that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to use that as evidence to justify the continuation of this longstanding tradition of thought that, you know, we're all currently subjected to. Conversely, then, what they're going to argue is in favor of this dialectic thought, okay? One that is more reflexive, right? One where, or rather reflective, it's a reflective form of thinking, where you actually consider the various multidimensional possibilities and potentialities that exist in human nature. We don't just rely, if you will, on the de facto starting point as where, as a means of, you know, uh, 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 we don't rely on the de facto starting point is what I'm trying to say here, that we've been, that we've inherited from Western society because it appears to be correct, namely for no other reason than, again, it's arbitrary and we're comfortable with it, right? They're going to say, no, we need to be able to imagine new and different worlds. And the only way that this is possible is with this mode of thinking that presupposes an antagonism. I emphasize the word antagonism because it's going to be one that we address multiple times throughout the duration of this podcast in different forms, right? But in this sense, and it's an antagonism between the subject, which would be you and I, and the object, which in this particular sense is understood as society, okay? So that we are free, if you will, to see possibilities that don't yet exist, but they can be realized. So basically, it's just a really fancy way of saying that individual uh, subjects like you and I, we should be compelled to have beef with the objective whole, this totalizing whole, because in doing so, it creates this space necessary where new and better worlds can be envisioned. Of course, this is not possible in a one-dimensional society, as the subjects, you and I, are assimilated into this object, and in turn, we follow the dictates of these external 
objective norms and structures and in you know in you know further doing so we lose the ability to discover more liberating possibilities and to engage in the transformative process necessary to realize them so that's all just a bunch of really fancy academic ways of saying that you know if we're not allowed this opportunity to differentiate ourselves as a subject individually from the objective whole then we're going to get we're going to get swallowed up by this mass produced society that has no interest in doing nothing but maintaining the status quo okay and this is the hallmark of one dimensional thought that's only becoming more and more prominent. I mean, this motherfucker wrote this book in the 1960s, dog, and it's only becoming more and more prominent now. It's like almost a scary fucking foreshadowing of the future, the things to come. You know what I'm saying? Because essentially what this one dimensionality does is it renders us, us it basically renders us slaves in all but name. Okay. Where we are held hostage, if you will, to external values. What do I mean by external values? They're not, sh it's not shit that you and I value personally. It's shit that we were told we should value by the society that we're living in. It's shit that we we're brainwashed to value by schools, churches, government, society, all that kind of shit, all these institutional forces. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that they've existed for thousands of years and that realistically they've only morphed in such a way to give the appearance of change. Again, when in reality, we're still we're still beholden to the same fucking structures of antiquity, man. What I mean by that is, yo, they tell us, for instance, that feudalism is over, but it's never ended, dog. We're still living under a feudal fucking society, just under a different name. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, there's the appearance of upward mobility, but from the majority of people, it's the fucking infinitely wealthy versus the rest of us motherfuckers who are just struggling to survive. You know what I'm saying? Um, another example with this would be the crown. We're fucking indoctrinated with this idea that this country, you know, undertook this revolution in order to divorce itself from the crown and engage in this, you know, instill a democratic society. But when we look deeper, dog, like, again, that's prima facie. That's in all but name. For instance, all the fucking presidents that we've ever had, not only are they all related to one another, yes, even Barack Obama, but they're all related to the crown, bro. So going back to the example of this Game of Thrones example, power has always been consolidated into this one elite group of people. And we've only been spoon fed, if you will, the illusion that has been democratized now in such a way where any average person could arise to the fucking position of president. It's not true, dog. It's never been true. And it's only further not becoming true. These people are fucking carefully selected depending on where they come from, who they are. And this is not a fucking conspiracy, bro. Just Again, just a cursory look at the relationship between all the presidents readily reveal the ancient bloodlines that are still fucking very much in place. You know what I'm saying? So to question this, of course, I'm going to label one a conspiracy theorist. And that's exactly the whole point that this Marcusean character is trying to make. The one dimensional thought. People aren't, they don't want, they're not, we don't, we've never even been trained how. Um, and even if we did, many of us wouldn't want to consider a possibility that other than that, which we've been indoctrinated with, you know what I'm saying? For whatever reason, there's plenty of reasons to dictate why. Maybe because they're afraid of reality slipping out between them. Maybe because they're more pragmatic in their thinking and they would rather, you know, ascribe to malice or rather ascribe malice to, you know, not to some sort of conspiracy, but just to outright ignorance and stupidity on, on the, on the offensive side's uh, behalf. You know what I'm saying? But whatever the case is, that doesn't stop it from being a fucking question that should be entertained at the very least. You know what I'm saying? And that without doing so, it's not going to be possible to create these new, different, better, perhaps even worlds, because we're still going to be beholden to this old world that's predicated essentially on the enslavement of the masses. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. I guess I should uh, further amplify that inherent in this proposition, this presupposition, is that, of course, people are even born to be free in the first place. You know what I'm saying? And what I mean by that is, you know, we're told we're free, of course, but it's, it's performative freedom. We understand that at best, okay? And maybe you can make the argument that this performative freedom is what is necessary in a society such as the one that we live in, namely in the sense that it's good to curtail certain people's freedoms, because if not, what's going to keep them from running roughshod over the rest of us? What's going to keep the physically powerful or the financially powerful from dominating the rest of us? But again, that's just at first glance, because realistically, we realize that that's basically what's happening anyways. You have the might of the military that's supplied by the financial resources of the powerful elite. And you start to realize, well, realistically, 
there's not much change since the fucking caveman days where those who, you know, might makes right, essentially, right? And that because of that, you know, perhaps this freedom that we're told about, it's nothing more than an illusion, if you will. It's not real. However, this Marcusean character is going to, he's not going to agree with this, okay? He's not going to agree with this. And what he's going to say is that the type of freedom that we're talking about is a freedom of creativity and a freedom of self-determination, okay? Self-determination, rather. Where we, as subjects, stand in direct opposition, again, to this totalizing object world, if you will, okay? Where we are perceived as actual substance, as actual people. Imagine that. Living in a world where we're actually considered fucking humans. Rather than Chattel, essentially. Prison planner, bro. We're, we're living on a planet where we're extracted at every fucking direction for the financial gain of others, okay? Imagine then this freedom, what they're talking about is one where we're treated as humans with possibilities that could be realized primarily and secondarily, we have qualities like our own individual values. And what I mean by that is not relativism per se, so much as you're allowed to have the value of immaterialism versus materialism, for instance. You're allowed to have certain aesthetic traits and certain aesthetic values as opposed to being force-fed the mass-produced and standardized ones that were fucking force-fed by popular culture. You know what I'm saying? And thus the ability to act on these fucking potentialities in a meaningful way. In this way, I mean meaningful in a way that isn't going to fucking just... It's not lip service. It's not performative. Performative here being fucking politicians taking meals to demonstrate their solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Bitch, get up off your knees and go write legislation. Similarly, it's not just about saying that all art is fucking, you know, and then by art here, I should have understood the fucking, in a broad sense, not just fucking people drawing on a piece of paper, but art in the Nietzschean sense, like the aesthetic work of one's life, where it's not measured in accordance to this mass produced standard that we're fucking force fed through Western capitalist society. You know what I'm saying? Now, how's that um, fucking Alton John song go? Not Elton John, John Lennon. I'm tripping, Doug. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. It's very idealistic. I get it. I get that what I'm saying is very fucking idealistic. But what these Marcusean types are going to argue is that the fact that it can be imagined is evident that such a world is possible, that we can, in fact, live in such a world. Now, obviously, this runs afoul of the conceivability argument. I can conceive dancing pink unicorns on the rings of Saturn. That doesn't necessarily fucking make them so. However, unlike the dancing pink unicorns on the rings of Saturn, we personally have the power and the potential to make these worlds possible. Or at least we're led to believe. And as we'll see here shortly, why? Okay. Now, again, the fact that it can be imagined is not evidence of the, or rather they're going to argue that it is evidence of the fact that such a world is possible. And if the current events of today are indicative of anything, it's that, it's that this is a world that many people do in fact desire. You know what I'm saying? This is not a fringe idea. This is a world that many people fucking desperately desire. But we're fighting against the one dimensionality that we don't really know different possible worlds to exist in. You know what I'm saying? So we're kind of just figuring it out, trial by error, if you will. Now, the problem, though, with these ideas, if you will, in my opinion, at least, is that, you know, they're not really taking any of these Marcusean insights into consideration. We're essentially, if you will, thinking in a one dimensional, now Marxist way. And, you know, one that is demonstrated time and again not to be compatible with human needs. And what I mean by that is not because, you know, the aims of Marxist utopias aren't possible, but rather because it's very rigid and one-dimensional in its application. You're trying to force ideology on people without first doing the groundwork necessary to un get people to understand why such, you know, ideology is necessary. And the only way that you could do so is by fostering fucking dialectical thought. But people aren't interested in fostering dialectical thought. They're interested in applying their ideology irrespective of what it may be. Again, the fact that we're living in a capitalist society is pretty fucking arbitrary, bro. Could just as well be that we were born in a communist one. We could have just as easily been in a born in a Muslim 
society, in a Jewish society, in an atheist society. It's all arbitrary. There's no fucking defined start and end points to all of this madness. You know what I'm saying? It's constantly an upheaval and can change from one fucking day to the next. Now, um, in that respect, then we get back to the whole idea of vibing low. So uh, specifically in returning to my previous podcast, the one uh, uh, episode 41, I believe, uh, to the beginning of this one, then the reason I've been vibing low or so low is because of the dread of realizing then how futile the desire to implement new and better worlds may very well be. What I mean by that is, dog, there's so many fucking people in this world. So many of them just in this country alone. And furthermore, they're all constantly being replaced by new people. People always die and those people are always replaced by new ones. Meaning, even if we were to implement this new, more humanistic ideology, inevitably that cycle would have to continue for as long as it is that we desire to live under such a, uh, under such a system. That's a very daunting task. And it's one that ideally, obviously, I personally can't carry on, not only after I'm dead and gone, but just me personally, I can't force other people, literally, I cannot force others, you, uh, my family even, to you know understand and then act upon the importance of this ideology, okay? And thus the realization that this battle for liberation will, it's, it's never truly going to end. And that's where the more existentially inclined questions start to come into play. What I mean by that is there might be temporary moments of victory, if you will, by either side, but inevitably the tides will turn, okay? And the cycles will reproduce themselves in perhaps even more sinister ways. And instead of, you know, fighting through this inevitably or trying to fight this process, we have to ask ourselves two questions. The first question is, is this all my life is going to be? Doesn't seem like a very authentic mode of existence if I'm just fucking following a pattern of behavior that billions of people have lived before me and billions will continue to live after me, right? Do I really want to be nothing more than a pawn in a game that has been in continuance since time immemorial? And second of all, is it even possible to break this cycle, this alternating cycle? And the simple answer for me to both questions is no. In regards to the second question, which I'll elaborate in further detail in a little bit, the answer is because that cycle I've come to realize and returning to my ancestral you know, knowledge, wisdom, it's a fundamental facet of reality. It shapes reality. It structures reality. It is reality. But we'll get back to that shortly. In terms of the existential means, what I'm trying to say here is I'll give you the example, if you will, from the fallout of the George Floyd tragedy. Now, initially, I was torn in this and that it seems as though by saying that I just, I don't fucking care. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I don't care. Not about George Floyd and what happened. Like, obviously, what, him dying is fucking devastating. But as I already discussed, like, yo, for one, people die all the fucking time, dog. Two, um, I'm not really concerned so much with earthly affairs. <laughs> I'm more concerned with the, the, the metaphysical affairs, the physical affairs. They don't, you know, like it's sad. I've already accepted the fact that life is suffering, not just for me, but for everybody on this planet. It's unfortunate that, you know, at least in this country, perhaps even abroad, black people teens, uh, are suffering at the hands of police, but suffering at the end of it all, this is the indifferentist aspect of it that I discussed in the previous podcast, is a fundamental element of existence. So when I say, I, it's not that I don't care, it's that I've understood that I cannot change that. I cannot stop all the suffering in the world ever. And I'm, oh, I'm, I mean, I'm okay with that because what else am I going to do? Drive myself crazy trying to control every element of existence? I'm literally not God. It's not possible. So when I say I don't care, it's more, it should be understood more in the sense that I've just given up fucking trying to change it all. You know what I'm saying? Um, but in doing so, I was kind of torn because it seemed as though I was relegating myself, if you will, to the fates and becoming specifically this inactive and thus tacit participant 
in the oncoming state of domination. We all see it. For those of you who don't see it, you're not looking closely enough, right? The writing's on the wall. We're fucking spiraling headlong into outright, utter, complete domination. You know what I'm saying? And I kind of felt that by consi- by removing myself from concerns of the earthly affairs, that I was being complicit and even tacit in the on in this. You know what I'm saying? But then I realized again to myself. I guess before that, there's the great quote. I believe it's been said by many people, but the quote states something along the line: "By choosing to remain um, silent in times of great, you know, upheaval, you're choosing the side of the oppressor." I'm butchering the quote. You get the idea, though, right? I know Martin Luther King said it himself, but then I realized, like, honestly, this is an in and of itself a form of one-dimensional thought. Because again, seriously, dude, what the fuck? What am I alone going to single-handedly change fucking human nature? Like, come on, dog. I'm not God. Again, it's nonsensical to think that that would even be possible. And to think otherwise implies this deeply egoistic desire driven by this unrealistic sense of self, the kind of which ultimately has historically at least led to fucking genocidal maniacs because it becomes this purity standard where that if you don't uphold it, then you're clearly the fucking enemy and must be destroyed. Whether it's the fucking fake woke liberal left, Hitler, Stalin, it happens. It's just another one of those things that fundamental facet of existence. You know what I'm saying? And try though as you may with all the governmental and fucking institutional forces you may gain in your life, you're not going to eradicate that. We could try our best to try to fucking check it, but inevitably that will always exist. It's a fundamental facet of human nature. So in this sense, I guess I should say... um, even though I was vibing low, a lot of the loneliness was directly a result of, obviously, the times that we're living in. And then I returned back to my ancestral wisdom and was saved even by my ancestors from feeling the need to have to even feel as though I'm compelled to try to change this fucked up world that we're living in. Now, I'll qualify it by saying, I know that sounds deeply fatalistic and I know it sounds deeply nihilistic, but it's none of the above. In fact, such a reading is actually a colonial interpretation of Nahuatl philosophy. Now, what I mean by that is simple. Part of this problem inherent with imagining new worlds, if you will, is the cult of personality associated with doing so. All of which can be easily avoided, I believe at least, by looking to the past to help us shape these new and better worlds that we desire. Now, what a new and better world and what past we're looking to draw from varies between people. And that's okay. Because again, I'm not looking to fucking sway every single person on this planet. I'm looking to make sense of it for myself. I'm trying to make sense of my life for myself. And if it's fucking something that you vibe with and something that you rock with, then hopefully it's something that, you know, can help you make sense of it as well. As for the other 8 billion people on this planet, I have no desire to change them or sway their beliefs in any way, shape or form. And those that do do so are deeply motivated by this cult of personality to be remembered, if you will, for being the person who saved all of humanity. I'm not driven by that desire, bro. This is a one-dimensional thought here in the instance of maintaining this European worldview, if you will, that sees um, all of reality between this battle between quote-unquote good and evil that will inevitably come to an end with the fate of the entire cosmos at stake. And depending on what side you quote unquote choose, you'll be held accountable for that outcome. To which the Nahuatl fucking metaphysics is going to say, no, dude, that's nonsensical. That's not how reality is structured. That is not how reality unfolds. This is typical us versus them, hierarchical European thinking. And you have to fucking divorce yourself from it. We have to, essentially, if we're following this Nahuatl metaphysics, which I am, I'm trying to, to the best of my extent. So when I say I don't give a fuck, it's because of this right here. Why don't I give a fuck? Because I realize that as devastating as all of existence is, I'm not going to single it, I'm not going to single it down to the George Floyd tragedy, because as tragic as George Floyd was, honestly, dog, there's more tragic shit happening right now. Just look at what's happening in Yemen. You know what I'm saying? That's far more tragic, in my opinion. But, um... What I'm trying to say then is that you divorce yourself from the realization that the unfolding of Teotel essentially is amoral. And what I mean by that is 
We're not just these mindless drones following along some arbitrary plan to a pre-established goal, okay? But rather, we ourselves are but a manifestation of this non-agentive energy that is simply unfolding in accordance to Teotel. We are Teotel unfolding. We are the universe unfolding, okay? Making sense of itself. And it unfolds as a constant state of interweaving, if you will, between various agonistic, there's the word again, dynamic inert relationships to not only um, create, but also structure all of reality. Now, as far as these pairs of dynamic unities are concerned, and they're agonistic in the sense that they are in constant competition with, another, with one another, and dynamic in that they are naturally paired opposites where one cannot exist without the other and is in constant competition with the other, and no victor will ever remain constant. Like, life will inevitably give way to death, but death will inevitably give way to light or to life. Darkness will inevitably give way to light and vice versa. Day will inevitably recede into night and vice versa. They're in constant fucking conflict with one another. They're dynamic in the sense that, you know, they're paired and they're agonistic in the sense that they will always be competing with one another. But it's not a competition to fucking for one to eradicate the other. It's a competition that highlights the strengths and weaknesses, if you will, of both. And in this constant struggle is where reality, according to the Nahuatl, unfolds. So, um, in this particular sense, what they wouldn't consider an dynamic pair is good versus evil. It's very interesting, okay? And it's not by mistake. And it's interesting in the sense that this distinction between the two is a uniquely European Christian introduction at least into our world. I'm sure maybe it exists in other worlds as well, but in our world specifically, and that of the billions of other people around the planet who have been, you know, force-fed and indoctrinated into this one-dimensional Christian worldview, the distinction between good and evil, that, that's, that's, that's their own creation. You know what I'm saying? And there are other cultures that don't conceive of the two as fucking, as, as anything of a schism. Now, I can't speak intelligently at the moment for other cultures, but I can speak on behalf of my ancestral knowledge of the Nahuatl metaphysics. And I'll tell you straight up, dog, they didn't conceive of either reality or human existence in terms of a struggle between good and evil. And thus, this distinction just it doesn't exist in Nahuatl thought. So what I'm trying to say here is that many of us will look at, let's say, the example of the George Floyd tragedy and dichotomize it in terms of good versus evil. And depending on where you stand, some people will say the evil people are the police officers and other people will say that the evil people are the rioters, for instance. You know what I'm saying? And depending on which, which stance you take, you will say that one of the other two groups needs to be fucking uh, essentially... Uh, one of the two sides, whether it's the pro cops or the pro fucking rioters needs to be squelled or they need to be fucking defeated in order for good to ultimately prevail. That, that's not what the Nahuatl are going to say, dog. They're just going to say simply, I should qualify this because I don't want to give the impression that the Nahuatl lacked a moral code. They had a very devout moral code, but again, it's not a Christian moral code. It's more about developing moral character and utilizing it in such a way to continue upholding their way of living. The only way of doing so, of course, is through the warrior scholars, but that's a different topic for a different podcast. But what they're saying is that the events that occurred, you know, with the George Floyd tragedy and many others, that's just a byproduct of Teotel unfolding. It's that simple. There is no good. There is no evil. Okay. Because again, Teotel is amoral. And since we ourselves are comprised of Teotel, it implies that we, and thus our ensuing actions, are as well. Now again, I have to stress that it's not because the Aztecs or the Nahuatl specifically lacked any sort of moral code. Like, nah, dog, don't be so fucking simplistic. You know what I'm saying? What it's saying instead is that unlike the European Christian epistemology that conceives of reality, as a schism between goodness, life, order, or light on the one hand, and evil, death, 
chaos and darkness that culminates in some zero sum between either or contradictions as in this, you know, fucking cosmic battle between uh, good and evil that culminates in the end of history, right? Where one of the two will inevitably emerge victorious. Like, no, dude, that's not how the not what view reality. Instead, what they're trying to say is it's all one part of the grand unfolding of Teotel. Remember, these people are monists. Our ancestral knowledge is that of a monistic philosophy. And as such, there is only Teotel. So to say that it's good and evil, or rather to say that it's either good or evil, is nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. Okay? Instead, what they're going to say is you have the structuring of two dynamic pairs and these unities that are unfolding to structure our reality. So instead of fucking... Christian duality, then what they would say simply is that, you know, reality is this never ending process, hence the process metaphysics that are associated with them, and where light itself is equal to darkness, and non being is equal to being, and life is equal to death, and all three of these alternate endlessly without resolution, okay? And thus, this idea that life is intrinsically good and death is intrinsically evil. That's again, this is a European construct that the Nahuatl reject. And they would reject as folly the idea that one must defeat the other because one cannot defeat the other. One depends on the other for, you know, existence. One cannot exist without the other. Life cannot exist without death and vice versa. Light cannot exist without darkness and vice versa. Okay. So, ironically, then, this is what brings us back then to this one dimensional man. And this one dimensional man is essentially one who has lost or is losing individuality, freedom, and the ability to dissent and to control one's own destiny. The private space, if you will, in which one may become and remain an individual self is slowly being lost. It's being whittled away by a society that shapes our aspirations, by a society that shapes our hopes, our fears, and our values while simultaneously and artificially stimulating and manipulating our vital needs, at least what we assume to be our vital needs, okay? And in short, the price that we pay for satisfaction becomes the outright surrender of our freedom and individuality. So in essence, then, what they're telling us is that we don't even know our true needs, bro. What we have instead... um, we don't have these true authentic needs. We have this heteronomous set of needs that have been instilled upon us by the dominant culture. You know what I'm saying? And it's this isn't enough to get people motivated to get shit done, okay? External passion, essentially, it's not real passion, bro. And hence why I've been further vibing so low. How does this tie into the whole fucking George Floyd shit? It's simple, dog. You start to ask yourself, like, okay, what is my actual purpose with this podcast? What is my actual purpose with the message that I'm trying to convey? Am I doing it for the act of fulfilling a passion that is deeply embedded within me? Or is it artificially imposed from outside of me? The videos that I make, am I trying to help others imagine new and better worlds? Or is it just to partake further in the benefits of capitalism? And if that's the case, do I really care about George Floyd's demise? and the ensuing fallout from the fucking riots and all that kind of shit? Or am I just using it as fodder to propel myself into some fucking sort of position that I find comfortable in the society that we're living in? And this realization really fucking hit hard, dog. It hit, it hit fucking hard as fuck. Because if I'm being completely honest with you, I lost my vision. I did. Not like my actual vision. I could see you. Whoa, kind of weird. Like I could see my camera looking through you back at me whatever the case is right when i say my vision i mean like what the fuck did i start the podcast for what the fuck am i making these videos for is it honest self-expression or am i just being reduced to this one-dimensional fucking mentality where i'm utilizing it as a stepping stone to secure a better standing if you will in this world that we're living in and if i'm being honest Yeah, it started as a passion project to, you know, finally serve as some sort of a creative outlet to express myself in ways that would bring me the happiness that I desired, irrespective of the number of people that I reached. 
Not to say that I had, you know, uh, I held back on saying things I felt were going to alienate people. Nah, that's not what I'm trying to say, dog. Um, what I'm trying to say is that instead, I began becoming concerned with approval for what I was saying. And in doing so, I became subsumed into the one-dimensional system that I've been lambasting this entire podcast. And that realization fucking hit hard. Why? Because the goal is to remain a radical individualist, one who is deeply disturbed by the decline of the traits of authentic or authentic individuality. You know what I'm saying? And I lost temporary sight of that. I allowed myself instead to fall victim to the longstanding historical erosion of individuality. And this is a process that it doesn't come without a cost. You got to pay the cost for this. You know what I'm saying? And the cost in this particular sense is realizing that in losing this cognitive ability to imagine different, better worlds, if you will, by trying to get caught up in the hype of how many people are watching my videos, how many people are following me and all that kind of shit, how many people are fucking downloading my podcast, how much approval am I getting for the shit that I'm saying? I submitted, if you will, to the power of the existing order because that's what the existing order desires. That's what the existing order is, gaining fucking status over others and trying to monetize it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And sadly, even deriving my worldview from this mode of behavior temporarily from the existing practices and modes of thought that are prevalent in our current culture. That's just a really fancy academic way of saying I fucking sold out and I paid the cost for it. What's the cost for it? I no longer felt fulfillment in the actions that I was doing with my fucking time in the labor I was engaging in with my time. The only value was the quote unquote currency that I attained from things such as likes, uh, followers, downloads, comments saying, fuck yeah, dog, that's a dope ass idea. And completely losing track of why it is that I even wanted to fucking devolve or de rather why I wanted to share these ideas in the first place. I wanted to share these ideas because doing so is a passion of mine. I wanted to share these ideas because I hope that they would help others uh, imagine new and better worlds for all of us to live in. And instead, I fucking fell victim to the trap. And because of that, I fucking fell into this fatalistic, nihilistic hole where work is not fulfilling. Just look at all the motherfucking nine to five people, right? That are fucking hating life. And I allowed myself to fall into that. And thus, you know, I would use anything. Fucking, that's what makes it even worse. The fucking realization that just like a, a fucking true industrial capitalist, I used anything, even the fucking misery of other people as a means to attain this goal, right? and it just no longer brought me happiness it was no longer bringing me happiness hence why i was vibing so fucking low dog what are the fucking practices this uh in, inherent with this society non-goal oriented passive inclined to be wallowing in nihilistic fucking despair shit thinking that is content with the status quo not just in terms of the society but personally as well so essentially, everything that I qualified the beginning of this fucking podcast with, how I was fucking feeling. You know what I'm saying? In short, in becoming alienated from the powers of being a self, an authentic individual, <laughs> excuse me, I became a one-dimensional man that is nothing more than an object of administration and conformity. And it's not just me, of course. It's all of us, dog. It's all of us. For those of you that have been following along consistently with my podcast, you'll know again that authenticity is a major theme in not only my life, but in this podcast, in all of my fucking posts. And thus the realization is that the desire to live in an authentic life is seldom one that follows this direct pattern. You don't really, you very rarely go from point A to point Z. There's the very rare motherfuckers that can, like David Goggins, you know what I'm saying? They have fucking fierce vision on the end goal and nothing gets in their way. And then you have the rest of us, like people like myself who need to read David Goggins in order to get the inspiration to fucking dig ourselves out of whatever fucking temporary pit stop or illusion of an end goal that we've arrived at. There's this great quote, I think, that I've... Um, perfectly summarizes this point that I'm trying to make by Kierkegaard and the quote goes as follows what I really lack is to be clear in my mind what I am to do 
not what I am to know, except insofar as certain knowledge may pr must precede every action. So I'll talk about it then in hopes that doing so obviously will provide not just a form of inspiration for myself, but hopefully you as well, a light, if you will, to help push past the feelings of complacency, complacency and failure that we've inherited from this one dimensional mode of thinking to continue to imagine new and better worlds. But most importantly, to remind myself and perhaps you as well of the importance of being kind to ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We ain't in competition with no one's essentially, dog. We're only competing with ourselves and we're not beholden to any external standards or values, but our own. This one dimensional form of thinking be damn, bro. You ain't got to fucking justify your existence on this planet. And as long as you're fucking keeping one foot in front of the other and continuing along with the vision, I'm not trying to be all preachy, but you're doing all right. Hopefully, this fucking low vibing times will come to an end soon enough for all of us. And in the meantime, I will just leave you with the wise words yet again, the wise insights to the filth goddess Lazo Teotu, and understand that it's all part of the process. The only way out of nihilism is through nihilism. And yeah, with that in mind, I'll go ahead and draw this podcast to an end. I hope you all have a great rest of your day evening morning whenever the fuck you're hearing this whenever the fuck you're hearing this i wish you nothing but love health and prosperity and most importantly happiness so until next time peace